So I'd just like to quickly hand over to our panel here and so they can introduce themselves so you understand actually who is in the room because uh, everyone over this side will be uh, wanting to answer because it may not just be Keith and Seamus. Uh, so I'll just hand over to, to Dave and they'll quickly introduce themselves and then we'll get into those questions. Right, um, I'm Dave Townsend, the supervising valuer contracted to EQC. Um, significantly I run a team of valuers that are working on the data produced by um, the engineers to settle, well, to establish what the DOV on the particular property was. These valuers are all in private practice here in Christchurch. Um, they work a certain number of days for us a week and then they're back as the normal valuer. So they're all completely independent of EQC. Good evening everybody. My name is Mark Correctly gal from Bank of New Zealand. I lead a team within BNZ um, called Future Hub. So for the last four and a half years, we've been managing EQC and insurance payments for our customers. Um, around two years ago, we realised that uh, people were finding it uh, particularly frustrating to get accurate advice regarding financial matters and also the ever-changing property situation in Christchurch. Uh, we set up a team of specialists to help people um, of Christchurch, not just BNZ customers, called Future Hub. We've been working with insurance, EQC, RAS, CTAS and others uh, and during that time have helped over 4,500 people uh, move forward and uh, over 500 non-BNZ customers. So in terms of uh, experience, um, so with the payments that, uh, that come through from EQC, uh, if you have a mortgage over your property, the bank has an interest in that property and um, EQC payments over a certain amount will therefore go directly to the bank each bank has a different approach to these payments. They may uh, want to understand the value change and what's occurred. And so if you do have a mortgage, talk to your bank. Um, just let them know uh, as soon as you uh, are aware of the payment how much it's going to be. And then they can actually help and give you advice there and then. Thank you. Evening. My name's Nikki Goss. I'm one of the managers from the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service, or CTAS in short. Uh, we manage the temporary villages that the government put in place to support people when they need temporary accommodation from their home. We also administer the temporary accommodation assistance financial package that kicks in when your temporary accommodation allowance runs out um, from your insurance company. And the third uh, stream of work is the Earthquake Support Coordination Service which is a government and non-government collaboration of coordinators who will work alongside a person who's having complex issues, difficult or hasn't got the ability to actually manage that themselves and support them through that process. We are at the hub um, on a full-time basis. Good evening, I'm Helen Beaumont from the Christchurch City Council. Now I'm in the strategy and planning side of council but Owen is here at the back of the room as well and he's in the operational side of council and may be able to address those questions. So council is responsible for an extensive stormwater network in the city and a drainage network which includes the, uh, those marvellous timberline drains as well as several unlined drains and the rivers and streams across the city. Council's also got a land drainage recovery program running post-earthquakes and that's addressing those catchment-wide issues that have led to increased flooding across the city that were in the EQC presentation earlier. So that ranges from uh, minor repairs on, on you know, little flap gates that stop the tide coming up into the stormwater network to investigating things such as tidal barriers and the stop bank system along the Avon and perhaps further protection works up the Heathcote. Council's also actively at the moment reviewing its district plan and we're extending and updating the flood management areas which some of you may be familiar with from a few years ago. So that's given the new land level data and also updated modelling data. So that's extended across the city. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Philip Chain, I'm a barrister. I'm one of the uh, residential advisory service lawyers contracted by Community Law to um, help provide that service. All right, thanks Philip, and thanks everybody on the panel and to Keith and Seamus. So this is your time, as I said, uh, please, I know it's difficult, but if you can just stick to your one question, it would be great. 
Uh, and also, can we please use the mics because we are recording this so that other people can hear your question and the answer so that uh, this information goes as far and wide as, as we can get it. So we're just starting down the back and we'll just come through. So, all right, on this side. Sir, thank you. Hi. Um, Mark, this is a question for you, thanks. Um, and I'm wondering if someone else could also point out whether this affects uh, diminu diminution of value. Are banks concerned about the drops in property values, especially those that are now unsaleable um, due to the hazard notice being put on them, uh, the 1 in 10, 1 in 50 year floods, and I've had notice from insurance companies now that those houses in TC3 that are prone to 1 in 50 or 1 in 10 year floods won't be insurable in the future if you change ownership. The policy won't be transferred to the new owner as it is at the moment. So it's very likely now that, okay, house might be able to be sold now, but the next transfer, it won't get insurance, therefore it won't be financed. Right, I think there are a couple of questions there. We don't have Mark. You want to remind me? Make sure I cover them. Um, okay, so uh, are we concerned? Yes and no. So, um, so in terms of uh, obviously there there are issues with individual properties. Um, in terms of uh, the impact of uh, of value, um, uh, that's why. Yep, and, and that's why we uh, we set up this team to um, uh, manage and have conversations with uh, with customers that were impacted um, with insurance and EQC payments. Um, that's why we work very closely with insurance and EQC in terms of um, uh, the impact it has on, um, uh, on customers uh, affected. Um, everything is uh, case by case. Um, there are some things that uh, none of us, you know, in terms of um, uh, council and in terms of EQC and government working through um, processes and, um, you know, having their own um, limitations or expectations. Uh, or an approach that they have to, to property. Uh, unfortunately, we all know it's very frustrating um, for people that are actually stuck and affected by those decisions. And there's not a lot uh, any of us can do, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the issue around insurance, um, that is something that we are working very closely with the insurance companies on uh, and having very um, robust discussions uh, because, you know, in terms of um, uh, that potentially has quite a significant impact on uh, everybody's um, uh, value going forward in terms of if there's no insurance, um, you know, what does that mean? I guess the, the final question would be, you know, where it's leading to, is are you in contact with the insurance council and the city council to manage or push perhaps a retreat as opposed to a payout that's not going to go anywhere? Yes, yeah, so so we do uh, we do work very closely with um, uh, with insurance um, and in EQC in terms of um, uh, having pathways for people. You know, especially when you talk about cash settlement, you talk about managed repair. You talk, uh, you know, you look at um, uh, insurance companies bias moving from a managed repair process. You know, you even look at EQC situation in terms of. Um, uh, moving away from a managed uh, repair process to having cash settlement. Um, the reason managed repair process was in place uh, was to ensure properties were actually repaired to um, an acceptable standard. So yes, there are concerns. Um, there are uh, lots of discussions um, going on uh, regarding these matters. Thanks very much, Mark. We also put that question to, to the Insurance Council uh, and the response at the moment from the Insurance Council is that you need to talk to your individual insurer and the subject of future insurability is not something that they have specific detail on. Okay, so we have put that question to them. I can show you the exact response if you want to see me after this. Okay, thank you. Sir. Yes, hello. This this uh, question's for, for Keith. Um, you mentioned in the previous uh, seminar that the IFV claims we settled, or the, the, the settlement packs will go out sort of from, from March and will extend into 2016. 
Is there any way of finding out when your own individual property is in that, that particular queue? You know, like, will, will, will we get to the pack in two weeks, two months, or sometime in 2016? Um, so first and foremost, we want to get as many packs out as we can this year. Uh, the reason we're suggesting it may run into 2016 is this is complicated, and I know that sounds like an excuse, and in some ways it is. Um, but realistically, we want to do the right thing, and we want to make sure that what we are passing out to people actually is robust. We could go quicker, but I think if we do go quicker, it will actually slow things down, because we will end up with more challenges and, and, and all the complexity that goes with it. In terms of how quickly individuals are going to be settled, we're running 15 queues across Christchurch. So we've taken an approach which says we're not going to start in the east and work west, and we're not going to start in the west and work east. We're starting with 15 queues, and we're progressing each of them. I'd like to say at the same pace, but in some ways it's, it's partly around geography and where do we get valuation support and so on and so on. So I'm not answering your question, but I am answering your question, which is we're trying to progress as many people as quickly as we can. Yeah, so if everybody gives me the call which says, can you tell me where you are in the queue, what will happen is it'll take longer. Um, I can't give you that assurance this evening because I can't do that for everybody, being honest. But we're trying to get everyone done as quickly as we can. Thanks, Keith. Sir? Yes, um, this is for EQC. Um, I, I've already been told that I won't qualify for a... Um, for the uh, as part as the, um, the payment for flooding, our house has been flooded. The section's been flooded three times. The house twice. Um, what I really want to know is, prior to the earthquake, we never flooded. I'm in the Flockton cluster. Pr prior to the earthquake, we never flooded. Since the earthquake, as I say, the section three times and the house twice. I want EQC to tell me why. What's caused our flooding? If, it, if, if it's not the earthquakes, what's caused it? Um, okay, so we're talking here about an increased flooding vulnerability, so absolutely something's changed, and, and I wouldn't dispute that things have changed. Um, as you've said, didn't flood before. Uh, we don't get many one in 100 year events, clearly, hence they're one in 100 year. Um, we can only deal with a change, and what we've tried to outline to you this evening is a process which allows us to identify a significant change which leads to a loss in value on a property, which we then assess and then we try to compensate you for. Um, Flockton is clearly complex. Um, I think a lot of Christchurch is complex, so I don't want to particularly say Flockton is the most complex, but it certainly has a number of specific issues. Um, as part of our customer advocacy group, which I mentioned earlier, uh, Flockton Cluster is represented in that group. Uh, we actually had a, sorry, a customer advocacy group meeting this morning. I was hoping Jo Byrne would have been there because she sits in that group as a representative of the Flockton Cluster. Unfortunately, she wasn't there. I'm not quite sure what the story is. Um, I've held out to Jo in the last 10 days an opportunity for us to come and talk to the cluster directly to talk about specific issues within the Flockton Basin, and I'm keen to do that. Um, what I would see that doing is reconfirming what we can do. And we've talked a fair bit about what we can do this evening. I think we also need to reconfirm what we cannot do. And there are issues around what IFV can respond to. Um, and I suggest that EQC can deal with a portion of flooding in Christchurch. Frankly, the council and maybe the central government has to deal with a much bigger picture. We're, we're not enabled from our legislation to deal with more than we're allowed to deal with. Now that may not be the answer people want, but I want to make sure it's coming over clearly. Uh, so I've offered to come and talk to Flockton Cluster, and I'm prepared to talk to you individually about your case, if you're happy with that. Cool. That's awesome, thanks, Keith. Sir. No. no. <laughs> Back up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if a house is sunk within its foundations and the EQC solution is to re-level it and leave it at the level it is at the current time, just 
make it a, as a, a flat house rather than twisted and sunk. Um, because the water level has increased and therefore the crust level has decreased, if you just level the house and leave it where it is, because there's a lesser crust, there's far less support. So that doesn't seem to be a fair solution. To the other way, it's like also thinking about the consent within the coastal areas. Is this a good idea to actually have consent allowed when you've got crust thinning? Because you're building houses on areas that have a far lesser crust and over time the sea's only rising, how can the council ever come to the concept that we can actually rebuild houses in areas that, to my way of looking at it, might well be better to retreat from rather than people spending all their assets and EQC spending their assets on land that is possibly not viable in the future? Right. So I think there are probably three in there. <laughs> um, the last part, so probably the last two parts, I'm going to look very closely to uh, Helen to talk to because I think those are council and, and broader issues. From an EQC perspective, I am not an expert on dwelling repair. Um, I look after the program which is looking at how we improve land on which people can then place buildings. Um, so I wouldn't want to give you an answer to that question where I'd be completely wrong from a technical perspective. Um, realistically, what we do with a land program is if there is a way that a repair to the land can be done, which is feasible and consentable, and the Q&As which are sitting on the chairs in front of you talk about what that looks like, then EQC will look to pay cash to the customer to enable them to do that. Um, realistically, from what we've seen with the portfolio of claims we've got, the vast majority of claims are not capable of being settled using the cost of a feasible and consentable repair. Now, that's for a whole host of reasons, some of which are stated there. Uh, so in those cases, we provide a DOV, and the DOV is then usable by a customer in whichever way, frankly, they wish to use it, taking account of Mark's point about where the banks might want to sit on that. Um, so that's what we can respond to. Now, lots of land claims are assigned to insurers, sorry, are yeah, assigned under deeds of assignment to insurers. And therefore, there are discussions which the insurers are probably having with customers about, is it a land remediation situation or is it a, an enhanced foundation situation? What is the most appropriate to use in that case? Now, if I try and talk any more specifically than that, I'm going to get myself into knots, which you wouldn't want me to do, I'm sure. Um, if you have a particular claim and you want to talk that one through, then let's do that. But I think the wider point you're making about where we should be building and where we shouldn't be building, I'm going to Helen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, so the, uh, that comes to that point of reviewing our district plan. And the replacement district plan has extended the flood management areas across the city. And there's now approximately 53,000 properties caught by those rules. And that's where we're requiring new development to have a higher floor level. And so that higher floor level is around those three drivers of flooding that we saw before. So the tidal flooding includes an allowance for sea level rise. And we've made an allowance for one metre of sea level rise over the next 100 years. And it also includes an intensity factor for uh, flooding from rainstorms and from the rivers, so that we've, we've got an expectation and a prediction that we're going to have more storminess in the future. So that's all built into our modelling. And the, the primary adaptation response, if you like, is to require new buildings to have a higher floor level. And that, and that doesn't stop the flooding, of course. You'll still get uh, flooding in major events, which will come across properties and extreme events come down roads and smaller events and just pond in, in smaller areas and those others. But it'll stop it coming through your living room, uh, which is the very expensive and very disruptive part of flooding. Now in terms of uh, sea level rise and the very much longer term, yes you're right, there, there are some areas of um, coastal settlements right across the country, it's not, not just here in Christchurch, where ultimately we'll have to think about retreating from them. 
Um, we're quite fortunate in that we do have some decades to think about that, but here in Christchurch that's been brought forward, if you like, by the earthquakes. So there are, there are areas close to the coast that have settled and we've had 50 to 100 years of climate change and sea level rise virtually overnight. Um, and that is something that we will have to grapple with. In terms of the district plan, we can't achieve that overnight. So uh, many of you will have grappled with your insurance companies and with your rebuilds and will understand about existing use rights under the Resource Management Act. So if you've had a house on a particular property and new planning rules come into effect, you don't have to comply with those new planning rules. You have existing use rights and you can rebuild the same house. That's not so under the Building Act, okay? So under the Building Act, if you rebuild a house, you have to comply with the Building Act. So if you, um, you have to meet the requirements for foundations, if you're, if you're on an unstable or difficult land, you have to address any hazards, such as you know, rock roll, roll or mass movement hazards, and you have to address the 50-year flood level with your floor. So the Building Act is different. You have to comply with the Building Act when you rebuild. But with the Resource Management Act, you can take advantage of these existing use rights, and the council cannot make you go to the new floor level in the district plan. We certainly give you information and um, encourage you to consider that information and consider be building to a new level to be more resilient. Um, but planning rule rules are not retrospective. So the insurance companies, if they so desire, they can use existing use rights, uh, rebuild a house at the level of um, the current level that it's been built at? No, not, not the current level. So they still have to comply with the Building Act, and the Building Act requires the floor to be at the 1 in 50 flood. So if the current level is below the 1 in 50, it has to be raised. Ma'am? actually phrase this really. Um, a lot of the information that we're getting from you and that is, is dealing with houses that are rebuilds in particular areas that will have to make the new consents and etc so they won't get any hazard notices put on them at all and repairs that don't require foundation repairs will never get any council hazard notices put on. What happens to those ones who have massive repairs and inclusive of foundation repairs, when they have to go through this process, they end up with a hazard notice by the council put on because their insurer does not have to build up their house. So you end up doing $300,000 of repair, get your founda foundation levelled, but because it has to go through a consent process for that with the council, a hazard notice is put on after that repair. And you still are prone to flooding, etc. And I mean, also on top of it, the council retrospectively have put hail notices via ECAN on areas around Christchurch included in this. So all of a sudden you've then got a hail notice put on. Now that, of course, they're saying is not accordingly um, earthquake. However, when I bought my house, I had consent by the council. It was developed. My house was consented. I did due process, everything. Now I just seem to end up with a house that I'm going to get a hazard notice put on it if I do X amount of repairs. I'm now also going to get that I've got the hail notice on that I can't do anything about. I'm going, what is the point? And why aren't these places looked at previously to be retreated like I'm on the coast? And I'm just totally stuck. And I know this is more than one question, but yeah. how are you supposed to make any decisions? I think, yes. Yeah. Can, you, can you guys get together afterwards? That's... I think that would be easier. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, ma'am. Yep. Ms. Rowe? No, we're all good. Ms. Rowe, yes. Yeah, I, I was a bit frustrated as well. Um, at, the end of last, at the end of last year, I got... I live in South Shore, TC3. At the end of last year, I got teams in three times, engineers and all that. 
And I got a report at the beginning of the year I was really happy with uh, how they're going to fix the, the foundation. And uh, then I got a team in to have a look how it had to be done. And I hadn't even seen that report I was very happy with. I said, and I had totally different ideas. And I said, what about that report? I've been here three times, engineers and all the rest of it. Um, ha, 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 well, we haven't even seen it. Where do I go from here? Again, I'm wondering if that is, a, we need to get together with someone and have a closer look at that for you. Yeah, um, yeah. Because what they are planning now, I'm not too happy with. Right. So is this with EQC? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we've Fletcher's. got some easy... Fletcher. All right. So we've got some people here. So can we catch up with you after this and look at that a little more closely? Yeah, yeah, okay. All yeah. right. Thank yeah. you, ma'am. So um, IFV is land damage. DOV is land damage. Why are you saying in your pamphlet here that it can be used for building repairs? I think it kind of goes with your question over there. Why are insurers, why, why, are we, why is EQC saying that that can be used to lift a house when the insurers are saying that they are not having to lift those houses to enact uh, foundation repairs and your you, EQC are saying that we can use the DOV payment to lift a house. What's the point in using the DOV payment to lift a house when it is considered non-consentable? Are you, is EQC admitting that they're actually paying for subsidence? E.g. lifting floor levels in flood prone in flood prone um, areas. Okay, so if if we go back to what is IFV, so IFV is increased flooding vulnerability. Correct. By choice, EQC would pay a cash equivalent for a repair to the land that's affected, which has been deemed as increased flooding vulnerability. Yeah. To do that, we have to have a consentable and feasible repair option, mm -hmm. and it has to therefore be possible. Um, most of the properties that we have assessed, there is not a feasible and consentable repair option. So therefore we move into a diminution in value. So diminution in value is to recognize, we believe in the best way we can, recognize the loss of value on that property for that customer and recognizing that realistically there isn't a repair option. If there was a repair option, we would be using the repair option, but generally that is not there because they're not feasible or consentable. So with a DOV, sorry, with a repair or cash in, cash for repair, there is an expectation that people will use that money to repair the land, as with any other EQC payment on a repair basis. With DOV, we can't ask people to use it for a repair because there isn't one. So realistically, people can use that money to do whatever they wish. If no, they that's want to. not what you're saying here. You're saying here that you can actually, you're abdicating, uh, you're actually letting the insurers abdicate their responsibilities for lifting floor levels by saying we can use the, the diminished value for lifting the house, which is why would we lift the house? We're not going to fix the land that's because what I'm, it's not consensual. So what I'm saying is I'm not going to make decisions for insurers. We're not yeah, going to tell the insurers in the what they can and cannot do. If people have assigned their land claim to their insurer, then they should have a conversation with their insurer about their intent, whilst also recognising there may be a financial interest in that decision. We're not... We're not going to tell insurers. We're not going to tell customers what to do. You're telling customers do. in this pamphlet. Sorry, you're, can you're I just see what you're we're referring to? You're indicating here, can IFV be payment, da 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 If, for example, it could be used to lift a house. Come on. It could be. It's unlikely, but it could be. It could it be used to buy a boat. It's not likely if a DOV can't get a consent. What's the, then the, the, the foundation's not going to either, is it? No. No. So why is that in there? Because it could be possible. No, that's a ridiculous statement yeah, you to can, make. You can top up, you you're can making top up a ridiculous statement. You're, yep. you're to retain the value, the original value of yep. the house, yep. get it back to what it was through 
right? Yeah. Right? Yep. So, this so we're not. Will be back to free yes. September 3rd. So, uh, potentially. Yes. You'd have to top that money up, have the conversation with Insurer, say, hey, um, whatever company's doing it, I'm going to kick in that, how many 10,000, but add that much to the height of the house. I'm saying that's, that's, that's kind of what you're indicating, isn't it? Yes, it's a possibility. Yeah. But it's also real not a possibility because the council have said they won't consent non remediated land. So how are we going to do how are we how are we getting around this? I think we're talking about two different things. Uh, one one is um, filling the land and and dealing with the increased flooding vulnerability that way, and that is generally not consentable in many of these areas because they're within flood management areas and there's quite strict controls on fill because what fill does is deflect those flood waters somewhere else. Um, and causes a problem for somewhere and someone else. But raising a house on its foundations doesn't deflect waters in that way. So raising a house on the existing foundations or the existing footprint or during the foundation repair process is consentable. And in fact, we're relaxing the district plan rules around recession planes. So where you breach a recession plane because you're raising your house above the flood level, that will no longer kick in a consent. So we will, we were, we'll, take that barrier away, if you like, to raising houses. So EQC are, in effect, by default, paying for subsidence of the <coughs> land, of subsidence of the, founda of, of the floor level? No, EQC are paying a diminution in value for land damage as assessed on that property. That's the end of what we're doing. What people choose to then do with those funds is their choice. The, why are the insurers expecting that? To I raise can't the talk houses? for the insurers. The insurers are not here. She's Brian may have an answer it? from ICNZ, or he can put this to ICNZ. It would be totally inappropriate for me to talk for insurers, and you know that. So why are um, so the you're, you EQC are paying for the effects of subsidence? You're not paying for subsidence. So I'll say it again. We are paying diminution in value as a compensation for increased flooding vulnerability as assessed on the property. The word subsidence doesn't come into that discussion. Uh, you do, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, that was used. Um, how, we assess, how we assess the quantum has a whole series of different steps. Clearly the land has sunk generally for there to be increased flooding vulnerability. Can't really achieve that any other way. Um, but that is not saying we're paying for subsidence. We're paying for an increase in vulnerability as a result of the earthquakes. So you're not paying for actual damage to the land you're paying for? No, it's for an increased for vulnerability. For, for uh, something that could happen in the future, yes. not, not actual damage? Not by this form of damage, no. no. But there's a possibility that that other form of damage could be asked for in some form from EQC. So it's a, it's a payment for an increased vulnerability as we're assessing it. Increased liquefaction vulnerability is going to be a similar scenario. I hope, I hope we're clear because I don't sense we are. No, we're not. I'll go back over the video and have a look and just see. You, you, you had, uh, uh, subsidence was mentioned uh, one or two or three times here. Yeah, I'm so not we suggesting it wasn't, but that we're not. Yeah, yeah, we're not paying for subsidence. That's the point I'm making. We're paying for an increase in vulnerability going forward. The fact that the land has sunk contributes to that likelihood. Mm. 